pulpit preaching a message to you know the church and I'd be like no not a chance because every time there was something in school like where you had to give speeches and all that kind of stuff I would bunk off religiously to make sure that I was never around for it I couldn't stand it it used to terrify me I could do absolutely anything else in school but stand up in front of people and talk but the beauty of standing behind this pulpit today is um, and I suppose it's actually prevalent to the message really like is it's not about me I'm not talking about me I'm talking about God trying to uh, trying to lift God up so um, with that in mind obviously last time I was talking uh, I was talking about Saul and how Saul wasn't a man after God's own heart and, um, and that David was a man after God's own heart. The Bible says in Acts 13, 22, uh, and when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom he also gave, or also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which, full, which shall fulfill all my will. So um, if you weren't here last time I, I did this, I'll quickly recap. Um, we were talking about King Saul and how King Saul had um, choices to make. In the uh, the message I was talking about, King Saul um, was going to defend Israel because the Philistines had invaded, and um, he was supposed to wait in Gilgal for the prophet Samuel to turn up, and Samuel would have offered a burnt sacrifice, and I'm guessing revealed to Saul what the plan was and how to deal with the Philistines and whatnot. But um, due to Saul's impatience and the growing pressure of the situation, with the Philistines turning up and amassing, and Saul's army was fleeing. There wasn't a lot of the troops sticking around. They were all scattering, the Bible says. Um, Saul decided to uh, take matters into his own hands, and instead of waiting for Samuel, he offered the burnt sacrifice. Now, I went into detail last time about why Saul shouldn't have done that. There's many reasons why he shouldn't have done it, but he's not a priest, he wasn't a Levite, and he wasn't commanded by God to do it. So he shouldn't have done it. And to make matters worse, the minute he did do it, Samuel turned up. Now, um, the thing he should have done was he should have repented and he should have, he should have said, okay, I've done wrong. I, I shouldn't have done it, you know, and ask God for forgiveness. But instead of that, he actually made excuses, made every excuse for why he was supposed to do it. And to make matters worse as well, Saul actually knew that it was wrong. When you read it, and Saul knew that he shouldn't have done it. That he was, uh, he felt that he was forced into doing the uh, to offering this burnt staff, this burnt offering. So Saul made excuses. He blamed everybody else but himself. He actually blamed Samuel. He said, "Because you weren't here the day appointed, um, I had no choice." Which is not true, really, because um, Samuel did arrive. He wasn't late. He was on time. It was just that Saul couldn't wait any longer. He, he felt he couldn't wait no longer. Now. That was a, a massive faux pas, if you like, for Saul. Saul definitely shouldn't have done that, but to make matters worse, Saul goes on to um, make further errors, really bad errors, after this. And because of which, Sa uh, Samuel said to Saul, because of what you've done, you're now going to lose the kingdom. You, you, God's not going to kill you now, but you will lose the kingdom. Your sons will not reign over the, the, uh, the kingdom of Israel. That's it for you now. When your kingdom ends, that's it. And... Um, as I say, so it didn't go very well for Saul after that. Like we'll probably pick up on that next time, like uh, just about what happens to Saul. But um, today, I wanted to sort of focus on the flip side of things. Like obviously, the Bible says that David's a man after God's own heart, and I want to see if I can try um, and explain how that is, and how we can contrast between Saul and David and the differences between them and whatnot. But um, before we get into it, I think uh, I think we need to get God involved. So we'll just have a quick word of prayer, and then I'll. Uh, I'll get into it. Okay, so if we bow our heads. Father, thank you so much for all that you've done for us, Lord God. You are so good to us. God, we thank you for um, the Lord Jesus. God, we thank you that as we sang the song before, God, only a sinner saved by grace. And God, we give you the glory for it because you deserve it. God, we pray that you'd help us now as, uh, as I go through what it means to, uh, to have a heart after God's own heart. And I pray that you'd help me to be a help to your people. God, that we leave here edified as a result of being here. God, uh, I can't do this on my own. God, uh, as I said before, I, I do not like public speaking, God, but it's about you. It's not about me. I pray that you'd help me to, uh, to give the message to your people, that um, souls will come to Christ if that's what's needed, God. And if, uh, as I said, if we need a course correction, God, may we, uh, may we get it today. Help us, please. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Okay, so um, if you've got your Bibles, 
I say that, I always say that, don't I? If you've got your Bibles, you should have your Bibles. If you come to church, you've got to have your Bible, haven't you? Well, if you've got your Bibles open, um, 1 Samuel chapter 25. <coughs> 1 Samuel chapter 25, if you've got your Bibles open or we've got it up on the screen, I hope. Um, before we get into the actual scripture, I just wanted to give a little bit of background to where we are, because obviously I know uh, in times gone by I've preached a little bit about David and Saul and whatnot, like, and uh, I'll just give you a little bit of background of where we are up to now, because obviously we're in chapter 25. Um, David's long since killed Goliath at this stage in chapter 25. David's fame and popularity has grown, so... He's well known in the, in the country and the surrounding countries, but um, because of so, uh, David's uh, infamy, I suppose, because he's so well known and well respected and loved, Saul um, couldn't handle it. He was so jealous and consumed with the fact that David was going to take his kingdom off him and Saul went to all sorts of lengths to try and stop David from becoming king. He, he tried multiple murder at assassination attempts, um, he just he was consumed with trying to kill David. Now, in the chapter before, chapter twenty-four, um, we're not going to read it. Like, but obviously, you can take a look at it at your leisure. Um, David actually spared Saul's life. David had the chance to kill King Saul because King Saul was pursuing him, and um, God gave him an opportunity where he, he could have took the opportunity and he could have killed Saul, and that would have been his troubles over. But God, uh, David said, I, "I won't touch the Lord's anointed." It's, it's not for me to, to kill the Lord's anointed. So he left Saul, he spared Saul's life. And um, at this point, uh, David's still on the run. I know um, Saul left, let things go temporarily, but he was always chasing after, uh, t after David. And at this point that we, pack, uh, that we pick up in the story, David's on the run and he's got 600 soldiers with him. And um, we're going to uh, touch into it now. So 1 Samuel 25, um, Verse 1, the Bible says, And Samuel died, and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him, and buried him in his house at Ramah. And David arose and went down to the, at the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel. And the man was very great, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he, was and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. But the man was churlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep. And David sent out ten young men, and David said unto the young men, Get you up to Carmel, and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus ye shall say to him that liveth in, pro in prosperity, Peace be both to thee, and peace be to thine house, and peace be unto all that thou hast. And now I have heard that thou hast shearers, now thy shepherds which were with us, we hurt them not, neither was there aught missing unto them, all the while they were in Carmel. Ask thy young men, and they shall show thee. Wherefore, let the young men find favour in thine eyes, for we come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thine hand unto thy servants, and to thy son David. And when David's young men came, they spake to Nabal according to all those words, in the name of David, and ceased. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shearers and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told him all those sayings. And David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword, and David also girded on his sword. And there went up after David about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. But the men were very good unto us, and we were not hurt, neither missed we anything, as long as we were conversant with them. And when we were in the, when we were in the fields, they were a wall unto us both by night and day, and all the while we were with them keeping the sheep. Okay, so we'll take a look at uh, um, the three central characters today. So obviously we've got Nabal, David, and Abigail. <clears throat> we'll, uh, we'll take a look at how David acts um, to these people. We'll take a look at how he interacts with these people in the account, and we'll actually uh, take a look at how he reacts to the situation that he finds himself in. So um, Nabal was a rich man. 
He had lots of cattle. The Bible says he had 3,000 uh, 3, sheep and 1,000 goats. So a pretty wealthy man by Bible standards. Um, and he and his shepherds, oh, sorry, not Nabal, but his shepherds had the flock right where David was um, situated with his men. Now, David started out as a shepherd. Obviously, we talked about David and Goliath a few weeks ago. And um, David actually gave an account to Saul about how he was a shepherd. And, uh, you know, I, I always used to think when David said he was a shepherd, I used to think, oh, David's just sitting under a tree with a harp, you know, like sort of uh, just taking it easy, like the sheep just doing their own thing. But it's not like that at all. Obviously, he's talking about like fighting lions and bears and all that kind of thing, like, you know, to protect uh, the flock from predators and enemies and whatnot. Like, so there was a lot of work to it. It was dangerous as well. Like, so I think David understood that um, Nabal's flock and all that kind of stuff, how difficult it was being a shepherd and all that kind of stuff. And they were there. So why not be of aid, be a help to these people? So... He and his, um, and his 600 men decided to help the shepherds by being basically like a security detail to them, like bodyguards, if you like. They would look after the sheep and the shepherds, make sure that no thieves tried to steal them. Because you can imagine if you're trying to look after 3,000 sheep. I mean, I, I can't imagine seeing 3,000 sheep in one place, but it would be a lot like, wouldn't it? You know, it would be quite easy to, uh, to lose sheep and, you know, rustlers and whatnot. It'd be quite easy to do. And the uh, same goes with, uh, with predators for taking them, because, you know, if you, if you allow it to keep happening to you, you won't have your sheep for long. So um, David and his men were an additional security detail for them, and um, they would look after them. So David's action, although he never was asked by Nabal to do it, he took it upon himself to do it, and his action was good. It was a good action that he did to Nabal. So we'll look at the interaction that he had with Nabal now. So as it says in the Bible, it was shearing time, so the, uh, the sheep needed shearing, and obviously there was a, um, a price to be paid for the wool that he would have, uh, that he would have been sheared for. So it was payday basically for Nabal. And uh, um, all the hard work, all the looking after the sheep and all that kind of thing, like it was time to get some money for it. So David sends 10 of his men, 10 young men, to, uh, to basically ask Nabal for a reward, you know, a reward for, for their hard work basically. So <clears throat> David had 600 men to, uh, to provide for, you know, they, they had to, uh, to their own needs that they needed. They needed to eat, they needed food and water and, you know, provisions and stuff like that. And that's what David was sort of asking Nabal for. Now, um, it was a request. When you read it, it wasn't a demand. He didn't say, look, I've done you a favour, you give me something for it. If you read it, he says, like, you know, he was asking um, what Nabal saw fit. You know, give me what you see fit. And uh, to say that, I suppose, he, he has done him a favour. It wasn't unreasonable for him to ask for, for something. He, wasn't, he didn't ask for a lot. He didn't ask for actually anything. He just, he just said, you know, give me what you think it was worth. Now, um, in ancient custom, you'd find that uh, the wealthy would always show favour to those who didn't have it as much, like, you know, um, especially reapers in times of harvest and things like that. The, uh, the reapers would be told by the masters to leave a little bit. So not to absolutely uh, take absolutely every scrap out the ground to make sure there was nothing left. They didn't do that. They would leave some for the poor people so the poor people could sort of, you know, take it and sell it so that they'd have something to, uh, to look after themselves and their families and whatnot. Like, so that was the, uh, the culture was to try and look after the poor. And, um, you know, it would make sense that if someone's done you a favour, you'd look after them, wouldn't you? You know, you'd, you'd think if someone's done me a favour, Okay, I, I can at least show them some kindness. But um, as we read in uh, verse number eight, ask thy young men and they will show thee the wherefore. Let the young men find favour in thine eyes, for we come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thy hand unto thy servants and to thy son David. So David was only asking for what he thought his help was worth. Um, and he didn't want to take nothing by force either. David could have just turned around and said, right, I think we've done Nabal a favour here. I think we should just take what we need and, you know, just have to deal with it. He didn't do that. Um, he asked. He, he did it properly. Um, but instead of getting the reward that he wanted, he gets a, rebu a, rebu a, a rebuke or reproach. If you read uh, verses 10 and 11, the Bible says, And Nabal answered the David's servants and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shearers and give it unto men who I know not whence they be? 
So, reading this, um, Nabal, as I said to you before, with, with David killing Goliath, everybody knew who David was. You know, he was well known throughout the countries and the surrounding countries as well. Like, it was a big deal, David. Everybody, uh, everybody knew who he was. So, the fact that Nabal's going, who is this uh, David and the son of Jesse and whatnot, he's just insulting them, basically. Um, and he's also saying that he's a rebel because he he's on the run from King Saul. So he says, you know, who are you, basically? He's just, he's just trying to insult him, and then he's saying, well, why should I give you anything? What's mine is mine. I didn't ask you. You know, you're not getting nothing from me. So he's insulted David pretty badly, like. And, um, you know, David's done him a favor, and instead of getting something for it, he's actually being insulted. Now, um, preparing for this message, I was trying to think of, of, of an example and this one came to me like you may well think it's trivial or stupid or whatever like but i'm going to tell you it anyway so um years ago we were working on a roof and um it was the the dead of winter it was absolutely freezing i mean like i don't know if you've ever been out and your hands are so cold that your fingers hurt just just for so cold and we were on this uh, this person's roof and whatnot and we were working it was cold and it was raining on and off and whatnot it was just one of them days where you wish you could go home but you sort of couldn't because you had to crack on but um anybody who knows me would know like i don't really drink tea or coffee or anything like that but on a day like today i, I could use a drink you know to warm me up just to uh, just to keep me going but um the people in this in this house never ever came out once never once asked us to um you know, would you like a drink or anything like that? Now, pay attention as well, right? If you're ever getting work done by tradesmen, Chris will vouch for this, Johnny will vouch for this, I know Dave's, uh, David will vouch for it as well. Look after your tradesmen. It only takes uh, two minutes to make a cup of tea. Isn't that right, Chris? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, make a cup of tea. Or if it's hot, give them a, give them a drink of cold water or whatnot. Um, just to keep them going, honestly. It makes a, it makes a big deal. Um, so, yeah, so I, even I wanted a cup of tea, and I don't normally drink tea. So um, I thought, I've never met this, I've never met this, the, this man, this woman, like we were doing it for somebody else. And uh, we were working on the roof and I turned around and noticed off the scaffold and the, the lady who lived in the house was out in this freezing cold weather trying to fix a flat tire. Now, I sort of, I was doing my thing and whatnot and I, I turned around and I noticed that after a while she still hadn't really got much further. I think she just got the up cap off. And she'd been there a while, like she still hadn't started jacking it up and all this kind of stuff. And I thought, I know, if I go and fix this tyre for her, she'll sort us out a cup of tea. I'm sure she will, right? So um, the lads are saying to me, oh yeah, go on, do that for us, because I wouldn't mind a cup of tea. Because we were out in the middle of nowhere as well, you couldn't just run out and go and get a cup of tea. So I goes down, says to the lady, like, you know, would you, would you like some help doing this, uh, doing this tyre? Now, normal people at this time would say, Yes, thank you. Would you like a cup of tea? But no, this lady didn't do that. She just literally stood up and walked away. And I just, I, I thought, I'll settle down. She's, she's surely going to come online now. She'll come out with a cup of tea for us and the lads. And um, she went inside and shut the door. And that was it, never seen it again. And I was like, has she really just gone inside after me offering to do this for her? And she hadn't even said thank you or nothing. And she won't actually offer us a drink or nothing like that. Now, I felt really put out. Like, you know, I, I was only a new Christie when this happened. This was many years ago, like, but um, I, I, was, I was put out. I, I was annoyed because I thought, I'm not asking a lot. All I wanted is a cup of tea. And I, I thought, I shouldn't even have to ask. It should just be inferred, you know. You should just offer it for it, really. But, you know, now, not only did I not get me cup of tea, but now I've actually got to do this tire for this woman. Now, the... Now the thing was on me, I thought, oh, do you know what, I could really just go, no, all right, if you're not going to give me a cup of tea, I'm not going to do the tyre. But we'll get to that in a minute anyway. So I, I was a bit like David, I was a bit put out. And um, to say the least, I think Nabal was a bit ungrateful. And um, we read in verse 13, um, And David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword. And David also girded on his sword, and they were up. And there went up after David about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. So, David and 400 of his men armed themselves. They, they got the swords. 
So you know David's in a pretty bad mood when he's thinking, when straight away his reactions to get the swords, let's get the swords, let's go. So um, he's thinking, well, Nabal's going to pay for what he's done because he's, he's offended me here. Like, you know, I've got 600 men that need looking after. We did them a favour and you've not only said no, but you've actually insulted me for doing it. So he was looking to get revenge. Now, David was taking matters into his own hands when he did this. Um, he wanted revenge, but as we read a while back, and I'll read it again for you now, in Deuteronomy 32, 35, the Bible says, To me, so now God now, belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come, that shall come upon them make haste. Now, David overreacted in this uh, response, and um, he was set on killing Nabal, making sure that he paid for what he did. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, when I said about saying that David's a man after God's own heart, and where we are at the minute, you think maybe he's not such a great example of why he's a man after God's own heart. Um, because, let's be honest, it's not the right attitude, is it? You know, he, he's overreacted. This guy's insulted him, and he wants to kill him as a result. Um, and as I said before, in the previous chapter, David did right. He could have he lost his rag. He could have said, do you know what? This, the king's been after me for ages. If I just kill the king now, I, all my troubles are over. I don't have to worry about it no more. But he said, no, it's not my place to kill the king, so I won't do it. I'll, I'll spare him because it's God's anointed. God will deal with him. It's not down to me. Um, now, um, David's a sinner, just like we are. David's not perfect. Now, I was looking at this thinking, you know, um, it says like David's a man after God's own heart. And you think, oh, that seems like a pretty tall order. Like, how can we, how can we aspire to this kind of thing? Like, but it shows that David, just like us, he's human. He's a sinner, and um, he wasn't perfect. But it's how he dealt with his sin that made him a man after God's own heart. And we can learn the lesson that David's about to learn too. So um, now we're going to see Abigail's interaction with David. So. Um, we we'll go back to 25, verse 3. So it says, the Bible says, Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. But the man was churlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. So when you read this verse, you may wonder, excuse me, why Nabal and Abigail are together. I read that and thought, well, it doesn't sound like... Um, like the well suited, like, you know, it says like she was a, a, a woman of good understanding, and he was evil in his doings, and uh, I'm thinking to myself that they don't they don't look like a good fit. Now we'll read a little bit more why in a in a short while, like but so um, David's intent is to kill Nabal and all that he's got. So verse 21 and 22. Says, now David had said, Surely in vain have I kept all that this fellow hath in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto him, and he hath requited me evil for good. So and more also so and more also do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave of that pertain to him by the morning light, any that pisseth against the wall. So Abigail's heard of, of what's gone on with Nabal. He's heard about the encounter with the David's men telling them about, you know, we've we've looked after the sheep. Um you know, we've come for whatever you see fit. And obviously Nabal's insulted them and sent them on their way. Um, so David is a famous warrior and, and he's annoyed. And the people, sorry, the servants has gone back to Abigail and said, David, everybody knows who David is. He's this famous soldier, he's this famous warrior. And he's in a bad mood. He's, he's intense on killing Nabal and everybody uh, in his path kind of thing. So you can imagine that, if that was the situation, he was, uh, and you had a, an army of 600 people who, who were intent on killing you to come and get you, you'd be afraid, wouldn't you? I know I would. But <clears throat> you may ask yourself, though, where is God in this situation? Like, um, God was well aware of what was going on. He was well aware of this situation with Nabal and David. And uh, um, he was understanding of what David planned to do. Now, God had orchestrated the interaction of David and Abigail to get David to change his course, to change his course of, uh, his course of action before he did something later on that he would regret. So it was no accident as well. I was reading this um, just the other day and I thought, why did the servant go to Abigail and not to Nabal? Because I'm thinking to myself, why wouldn't he go back and say to Nabal, look, he's, he's intent on killing us here. But 
I think with it saying that um, Abigail was a woman of good understanding, she was very wise. I think the Nabal, uh, with him being probably not as wise because he wouldn't have offended this guy if he, if he had any sense. So the, the servant would have gone to, uh, to Abigail and said, look, this is what's going to happen. I think we need to do something about it kind of thing. But um, sometimes we can find ourselves headed down a path that God doesn't want us to go down. And God will often put people in our way, situ orchestrate situations so that we can change direction. Because God will send us, sorry, God will try and stop us from going down these paths. Just like David was intent on killing Nabal. And uh, God wanted to try and give him a chance to see what he's doing wrong, repent and, uh, and turn away. So um, Abigail, when she's heard what's going on with, the, with David, set on killing her. And they were killing Abel rather. She uh, she took it upon herself to get um, food and provision sorted out quickly, and get it to David so that David could sort of um, be not bought off, but be given his reward that he actually should have got the first time round. So, um, but also she she was looking to pay the debt, but she was also trying to plead with David to see reason. And uh, in verses twenty three through thirty one, we see. Uh, the interaction between Abigail and David. I'll just have to take a sip of this before I get into that. <clears throat> Very warm today. Um, so yeah, verses um, 23, the Bible says, And when Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass and fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground and fell at his feet and said, unto, and said Upon me, my Lord, upon me let this iniquity be. And let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience, and hear the words of thine handmaid. Let not my lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, thy handmaid, saw not the young men of my lord, whom thou didst send. Thou didst send. Now therefore, my lord, as the lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, seeing that the lord had withholden thee, from coming to shed blood and from avenging thyself with thine own hand. Now let, the en let, now let thine enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now this blessing which thine handmaid hath brought unto my Lord, let it be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. I pray thee, forgive, this, uh, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because the, my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord, and evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. Yet a man is risen to pursue thee, and to seek thy soul. But the soul of my Lord shall, shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. And the souls of thine enemies, shall he, them shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling. And it shall come to pass, when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he hath spoken concerning thee, and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel, that this grief... Now that, that, that this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offence of heart unto my Lord, either that thou hast shed blood causeless, or that my Lord hath avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, then remember thine handmaid. So that account um, shows uh, Abigail's wisdom, her humility and her humbleness, unlike Nabal. Um, Abigail comes to David and humbles herself before him. And she even offers to take the blame for, uh, for Nabal and ask him for forgiveness for something that she never even did. She actually was prepared to take the blame for what Nabal did to, uh, to David. And um, she asks David to accept the offering for the food and whatnot. Now, um, she was a far better wife to Nabal than Nabal was a, better, to Nabal was a husband to her, I think. Um, remember when I said to you before about how I wonder why these two are together? I mean, when you look at it, it says that Nabal is in verse 17 a man of belial and yet abigail is understanding and she refers to god as lord she's she's got an understanding of god and his promises she understands that david is anointed king and that he's promised to be king because god said so um and yet she's trying to give david some perspective on the situation try and point him back to the lord now how many times have we lost it like david you know, we've been offended or whatever, like, and we can get um, so caught up in the situation that we forget about God. And um, sometimes we just need someone to bring us back, to, to help us to see our, the error of our ways and that, you know, it's not about 
If it's not about us, it's, it's about the Lord. Now, uh, coming back to my situation with the cup of tea, um, I didn't have a, an Abigail in that situation, like, but I suppose I did. Uh, it was the Holy Spirit that was dealing with me. Because I was annoyed and I wanted to leave that tyre. I thought, you know what? I've got a good mind today to take the tyre off and go and throw the tyre away, like, so you haven't even got the tyre. But um, instead I realised that I'm, I'm, I was overreacting. Um, and as a Christian, I should know better, you know, it's not about me. It's about, um, it's about the Lord and it's about me being uh, more like Jesus. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm supposed to be a stepping stone, not a stumbling block to, uh, to unsaved people. And how would it have looked if I'd have, if I'd have done that? It, you know, the, the lady would have thought, well, if you're a Christian, like, you know, I, I don't want any of it if that's, if that's how you're going to be. But, um, so, to put you out of your misery, I, I swallowed my pride, I put the tyre back on. Um, I didn't get my cup of tea in the end, but I cracked on, we just got the job done. And, um, and that was the end of it. Like, but you may think to yourself, well, Stu, you know, David and all that with the 600 soldiers and you're, you're going on about a cup of tea. Um, but I honestly think that God was setting me up for, um, for a trial that came later down the line. Obviously, this is years and years ago kind of thing. But um, God's testing and God will, God will test you so that when the big trials come, you can handle them, you can face them better. Now, um, I only thought about this one the other day, like, but I thought I'll mention, I'll share this with you. Uh, once upon a time, once upon a time, it wasn't that long ago actually. I was working as a subcontractor on um, on somebody's house for a builder who uh, who, who I've known for years and years, and um, he said to me, "Can you come and do the roof for me?" So I said, "Okay." So I had to buy all the stuff, fit all the stuff, and all that kind of stuff. So I had to go through all that and whatnot. And uh, the guy said to me, "Look, um, I can't give you any money until the job is complete." So I said, okay, no problem. We'll just do the job and we'll, um, we'll get sorted out at the end. So uh, I wouldn't mind as well. Like this job was pretty, uh, pretty heavy. Like it was close to 10 grand, this job. And I'd, I'd laid out quite a lot. Spent quite a lot of time doing it as well. Like, but um, I, I never thought nothing of it. Now, um, towards the end of the job, we were finished and all that kind of stuff. And I needed to get the money and, and pay for all the things that I paid for. Um, the guy had turned round to the builder and said, I'm not giving you no more money and um, that's it, you know. So I'm like, what am I supposed to do? I've spent all this money on, on the roof. I've put this new roof on and, uh, and what, I'm supposed to walk away kind of thing. Now, um, I was already annoyed by this. I was, I was like, it's never happened to me and it's never happened since that. But um, I was like, this guy's not getting away with this. I'm not letting this slide, not a chance. Now, to um, sort of coin a little bit like Nabal, to add insult to injury, the guy actually turned around to me and said, you've done a good job as well, Stu. In fact, I'd be uh, you know, well inclined to recommend you to other people. And I was like, that was just, that sent me sideways. Cause I was like, you've not only telling me you're not gonna give me the money for something that, I, that we agreed to do, but now you're saying you're not gonna give me the money, but you did a good job. So I was like, I was proper seeing red then. I wanted this guy's blood. I was like, I, I, I can't have this, you know. I, I've got to get my own back. In one way or another, I will deal with you. There's no way I'm letting you do this to me. Because at the end of the day, it's quite a lot of money. I mean, you know, and, and I've still got to pay for them materials. Like, they're down to me. And in effect, they're taking money off my family's table. And just all this kind of stuff just really got to me. And I was like, I was just seeing red. I just wanted to spray this guy's head across the wall. And um, I was like, you know, I've got to do something about it. I've got to get me revenge. So, um, so me and the me and the builder, we gathered on our swords. Just seeing if he's paying attention, right? We didn't have swords. We had hammers instead. Didn't do any of that though. It didn't go like that. Um, but as I said to you before, like the uh, the Abigail in my story, the Holy Spirit was sort of dealing with me, because. I was like, I was seething, I just wanted, to, I, I thought, there's no way he's done this on purpose, you know, th there was no reason to be like this. But God was dealing with me, because he needed, he knew that I needed a course correction. And I could, I could feel like God was speaking to me saying, am I not in control? 
am I not still on the throne? I'm more than capable of sorting this situation out, Stu. I don't need your help to sort this out. Um, don't you trust me? And I was like, yeah, but I, I want to deal with this. You know, this guy's got to pay. He's, he's offended me. He's, uh, he's taking money off my family. And um, I really struggled with that. But um, God can fix it. God just wants us to see that God wants us to have the right attitude about these things. Now, I know that God can fix it. God's done stuff like this in the past for me. I mean, I haven't got time to go into all the sort of things where God sort of come through for me and whatnot. Like, but my uh, the temptation to do wrong was so bad. I, like, but then I remember that like First Corinthians ten thirteen came to me. It said, "There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able." But with, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, I was thinking, God's made this situation. I can, I can, I can overcome. I don't have to give in to this. Like God said so. It's a promise. So, um, I, I, I really did struggle with it for a while. Like I mean, it it took me a good couple of weeks to um, to sort of put this thing to bed and whatnot. Like, but things need to be dealt with in a proper way. And taking matters into my own hands would not have been the right way because um, my uh, my role as a Christian is to lift up God, to honour or to show honour and to bring honour to God and not to trample his name by carrying on in such a way that would uh, be defaming to God. Um, now, uh, you can see that there are people watching all around us. If, if you're a Christian today and whatnot, like, People are always watching it, you know, God's always watching and God's always listening, but there are people who are around and they're watching and they're listening and you don't know who's listening sometimes, like, because, um, I, I mean, this isn't part of the, the message and whatnot, like, but I was only speaking to a guy a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we did a little job for his for his mum. He wasn't there, like, but his mum and his brother lived in, this, uh, lived in this house and we were doing the garage and um, we were doing the job. And I didn't think anything of it, to be fair. Like, I didn't think anyone was watching, didn't think anyone was listening. And uh, we were doing this job, I won't bore you with the details, like, but there was a situation where the job could have been done a little bit differently, would have saved us a bit of time, probably wouldn't have looked as nice. Um, still would have done the job, though. And um, someone said, well, why don't you do it like this? You know, save us a bit of time, it'll still be all right. And I, I said, no, no, if we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it properly, like, you know, we'll, we'll, I want to do it properly. Now, I didn't know that anyone was listening kind of thing. Like, And he, he pulled me about it a, a week or two ago. He said, you know what? He said, I, I can't believe it's true. He said, it's really refreshing to hear the fact that um, you, could have, you could have took the easy road. You could have done something that, you know, wasn't your best. And you chose not to. Like, And, and I thought, do you know what? Um, this guy knows I'm a Christian, like, you know what I mean? And I thought, if ever I'm going to win this guy to Christ, he needs to see a difference in me. Because I could have turned around and I could have gone, do you know what, I'll be all right, that guy, we'll do that. You know what I mean? How would that have looked for, me, for my testimony, do you know what I mean? This guy would never ever sort of think, well, if he's a Christian and he's acting the same way as, as, as I would, then what difference is there, do you know what I mean? So, um, as I say, you never know who's watching. You never know who's listening. I mean, obviously, I know God's always watching and God's always listening, but um, we need to be Christ-like examples especially when we're out in the world and especially when we're dealing with situations where we're, we're tempted to blow up. So, um, yeah, so back to the, uh, the the account of David and Abigail. So she um, she speaks to David. She tries to get David to see that vengeance is not the answer and that he's wrong in what he's doing. So um, it says in verse 32, verse 32 to 35, uh, <coughs> Uh, and David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee to me this, this day to meet me. And blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thou which hast kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with mine own hand. For in very deed, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which hath kept me back from hurting thee, except thou hast hadst hasted and come to meet me, surely there had not been left unto Nabal by the morning light any that pisseth against the wall. So David received of her hand that which she had brought on, which she had brought him, and said unto her, Go up in peace to thine house. See, I have hearkened to thy voice, and have accepted thy person. Now, there's three things about the uh, the reaction that David sort of has with the Abigail here. And uh, the first one is that 
He recognises and praises God that God had sent Abigail to David to get him to see reason, to get him to see sense. Now, as I said to you before, God will send people to us to, uh, to get us to change direction and to get us to see that we're in the wrong and that we need to, uh, to get back to God. We need to repent and we need to turn back to God. Um, obviously, the situations I was talking about there, um, I didn't have a physical person, but obviously the Holy Spirit, which, you know, um, is better than any person could have been, like, was there to, uh, to set me straight to get my course back on track. Um, so, yeah, it was... Um, it's, like I say, when we're talking about course corrections and all kinds of stuff, there are people God puts in your way to see about changing your course. Now, you could be here today, you could be watching online, you could be doing things your way, you could be taking matters into your own hands about a situation and um, forgetting God in a situation. And if you're watching this today and that's going on, it's no accident that that's the way it is because God's orchestrated this. And uh, it may be well down the line, someone else is watching on the internet and it might be happening. It's never an accident when you, when you see things like this. Um, but if, um, if someone confronts you about it, take comfort in it because of the fact that God loves you and he loves you enough that he's trying to get you to straighten out. He wants to, he wants, um, he wants to put you on the right path. Now, as um, I always think with, with my kids and whatnot, like when they're, when they're acting up and they say to me, why did you always get on my case about these things and whatnot? Like, and I say, well, it's because I love you that I actually want you to do good and I have to... Um, I have to scold you, I have to, you know, I have to chasten you, if you like, to get you to do right. Because, it, you know, you'll find that the people who are sort of the worst, it's because the, the people don't love them, the parents don't love them enough to actually instill any correction in them, and they just let them do what they like. And I think to myself, letting them do what they like is not a good thing. I actually want them to do right, but in order to do that, sometimes I've got to, I've got to do things to, uh, to, to bring about correction and whatnot, and it's the same with God. So... Um, so the yes, so that was it. So David pra praises God. Number two, um, David heeded Abigail's words. Now, in Bible times, it was rare that a woman, excuse me, would ever give counsel to a man, uh, especially a man who's uh, who's angry and uh, and has got four hundred uh, four hundred soldiers ready to do damage. Um, she was quite brave in uh, in her actions towards David because David could have just went, nope, not listening to you. And, uh, and done away with her straight away, but he didn't, he listened to her. And um, number three, David actually repented. Now, um, I was talking about Saul and all that before, like how Saul made all the excuses, and he still wouldn't repent. He, he said, that it wasn't me, it was this, 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 and this. It wasn't my fault. Whereas David was like, right, okay, I've made, I've done wrong, and, um, and I've seen the error of my ways now, and he stood down the attack on Nabal and never went to, to carry it out. And that's what sets David apart, is the fact that um, David was willing to accept when he was wrong. He was willing to acknowledge that he was wrong, repent of the sin that, uh, that he's guilty of, and go back to God. Now, when we walk in the flesh, when people set us off, and they say things to us that kick us off, or, something, or a situation happens, and, uh, and we blow up, we can lose sight of God. Um, we've got... Two cho or we've got one of two choices to make. It's either we go it like Saul, who, as we say, Saul's not a good example. Saul made excuses on how he could justify himself, how um, how it was everybody else's fault, but not my fault. It's not my fault. It's uh, I I'm doing it my way, and um, it's it, 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 that's it. I'm not, I'm just going to make excuses until sort of uh, that's it. But David was like, no, um, I've done wrong. I need to get back to the Lord. Now, a man after God's own heart will recognise when they're in the wrong and ask God for forgiveness. Because at the end of the day, as I said to you before, like if, if you're a Christian here today, our job is to, uh, to serve and be pleasing to God. Not to, uh, not, it's not about us. This life is not about us. Sometimes we can get so carried away about what, um, what we're going to do, where we're going to go, what we're going to be all this kind of stuff, and it's, it's not about us. I struggle with this as well, like, you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not trying to pretend like I'm, I'm anything special because I, I am the chief of all sinners standing here today, like, but um, it's, it's about how we deal with our sin. We can't, um, we can't make excuses for it. We've got to repent and look to God and ask for forgiveness. Now, um, as a Christian, if you're a Christian here today, we still sin, just like David did. David sins, I mean, obviously, this isn't the only time that David sort of um, 
made a mistake. David goes on to make mistakes. But we still, as Christians, still go on and make mistakes. We make mistakes all the time. But it's all about keeping short accounts with God and getting back to God as quickly as you can. Re as you realise that you've made wrong, you need to get back to God as quickly as you can. Now, as I said here, we can have God's a heart after God's own heart. We can be a, uh, we can have a um, a heart after God's own heart if we follow David's example. Yeah really easy we just need to accept when we're wrong we need to see that when someone's challenging us and saying look what you're doing is wrong you accept what they say you take it on board and you repent of that action and that's just about how getting saved is like you know when people say like oh how do you go to heaven and all that kind of stuff I, I always say well there's three things you need to understand and this is me doing the uh, you know trying to give them the course correction you've got to admit that you're a sinner I always say like when I when I teach the kids it's like the ABCs you know it's dead easy to go to heaven like God never made it difficult to go to heaven it was so easy like what we make it we as people make it difficult we go oh we've got to do this and we've got to do that and and we make it so difficult I always remember as a Christian well, when I was when I was unsaved I, I, I was so confused about how uh, how to go to heaven it was untrue because when the, the guy who, who led me to the Lord I said well don't you have to be good and you know when you die you're good like where you're bad and all that kind of stuff and he went no it's not like that at all it's dead simple how you go to heaven God made it really really easy all you've got to do is understand that just like David, David took matters into his own hands. We take matters into our own hands. We've gone against God's way. God's got a way and we've gone, no, I don't want that. I want to go my own way. And that's sin. But going against God and doing your own thing, taking matters into your own hands, that's sin. Now, um, as the Bible says, the wages of sin is death. When we die and, and we die in our sin, we're in hell, separated from God forever. God never ever designed hell for us. God was never des God never designed hell for mankind. Now, um, I, was, I was thinking about this the other day. I think John, you said it a few weeks ago, like you know about saying about how we've got people who we know or loved ones who, who've died and gone to hell. And I, I think to myself, do you know what? As horrible as that is, you know, there's nothing I can do for them people now. They've died and they've gone to hell. But if you're alive, you're drawing breath and you're listening to me now, and you're not saved, you need to listen to the uh, to the the course correction I'm trying to give you. I, I want you to go to heaven. And God certainly wants you to go to heaven. He doesn't want you to die and go to hell. And that's why Jesus came. He died on a cross. He's buried and he rose again. And all we have to do, as I said to you before, the, uh, the ABCs, we need to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And um, believe that he died in our place on the cross, taking all our sins, past, present and future. So when people say, oh, I, I'm saved, but... Um, but I had a car crash and somebody died. You know, does that mean I'm not going to heaven? God paid for it all. God saw your life. He saw it all the way down to the day you died. And he said, I've paid for every single sin. Now, that doesn't mean it's okay to go and do that. You know, but obviously, you know, things do happen and they're out of our control. Like, but as I said to you before, when we do wrong, we need to get back to God as quickly as we can. Um, now, um, as I said to you, Jesus died on the cross and um, we just need to believe that he died in our place and that all it is, is about is calling on Jesus, confessing that he is who he says he is and asking him to save you from your sins. Dead simple. I did it 15 years ago now. Best thing I ever did. The best, best night's sleep I ever got was the night I got saved because I realised that up until that point, if I died, I'd have burned in hell forever. Now, I was only thinking, um, I think I was listening to something yesterday and I thought uh, about how... They were, um, the moment they died, they had been burning in hell for thousands of years and how terrible that must be. But God never wanted it. But if you won't go God's way, that's the only way that's left to you. God doesn't want that for you, but it's a choice that you have to make. God will never force you into that choice, just like he never forced uh, David to do that choice. D David was given an opportunity to turn from what he was doing, just like I'm trying to give you an opportunity to turn from, you know, the, the sinful life that you're living now. Because we're all sinners. I'm not pro professing to be anything special. I, I'm not, I am a sinner. I still make mistakes. I still do wrong. But um, I, I pray that when I do wrong, I get back to God and I repent of my sins quickly. And that's what it's all about. So I challenge you today, if um, if you don't know Jesus as your saviour, uh, I trust that you will get it settled because no one knows how long we've got left. Um, we could die any time. Your heart could stop beating at this moment in time and that's it. Then there's no coming back, no second chances. That's it. So um, what are you going to do with Jesus? Are you going to follow his course? Or are you going to go your own way? Uh, Saul went his own way. I didn't work out for Saul. I'll touch more on that next time I come back. Um, 
But yeah, if you've got any issues, you've got any questions or whatever, I ask you to reach out to us uh, online or if you want to come speak to me or John or, or anyone, you know, please come see us. We are uh, approachable. Um, that's pretty much me done for today. Uh, I pray that we uh, we've got something from it. I'll um, I'll pray and then we'll uh, we'll sing a hymn. Father, thank you so much. God, you are so good. And we pray that you would uh, help us, please, to leave here changed today. God, that uh, if we're carrying on down a path that you don't want us to go on, that you would send someone, Lord, be it uh, physical or even the Holy Spirit, Lord, to uh, to challenge us to uh, to see that we're doing wrong and to get us to to turn back to you. God, we pray that you'd help us be with uh, those who are, uh, who are not here today, Lord. God, help us to be challenged, help us to be a gospel light in this uh, in this dark and sinful world. God, we know that there are people watching, but they need to see a difference because uh, how are they ever going to get saved if, uh, if we act the same way as the world? God, help us, please. Be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, if you would uh, stand with me, please. Turn your hymn books one last time. I have to sing a song now, Gary. Six, seven, eight. <clears throat> Six, seven, eight. Trusting Jesus. <clears throat> <clears throat> 